Now on BBC World News, tough questions for people shaping the news this week. Hard talk. Welcome to Hard Talk from Singapore. I'm Stephen Sacker. This city-state is one of the remarkable economic success stories of the last 50 years. If you want to find a place that has ridden the wave of globalization, well, this is it. But storm clouds are gathering over Singapore. President Trump is challenging assumptions about global free trade. Security tensions are rising across East Asia. I have an exclusive interview today with the Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Sian Lung. Is Singapore feeling vulnerable? Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long, welcome to Hard Talk. Hello. Let's start with the international political climate. Donald Trump is now President of the United States. He talks about protectionism. He talks about ripping up trade deals that have been bad for America. How dangerous is this new political climate for Singapore? We are watching it very carefully. Uh, we of all countries depend most heavily on trade. Our foreign trade is three and a half times our GDP, probably highest in the world. Uh, we have free trade agreements with many countries, including the United States. Uh, we participate actively in the WTO. And uh, we have depended on the system which America has built and upheld to maintain an open global intercourse of trade, commerce, investments, finances, which have prospered most countries most of the time. There's a new mood in America. President Trump reflects that. And we'll have to watch carefully what policies he pursues. Tell me your reaction. When Donald Trump says things like this, and this is a quote, the globalized trading system has led to the greatest job theft in the history of the world. Well, there are many views on that. And in Singapore's case, we don't, it has not done that to us. I think in America's case, there are many American companies which um, have prospered because they are all over the world and therefore there's a base in America. But this is a view which a uh, segment of Americans hold and I think the president reflects that. Worried? Alarmed? It depends what he actually does because uh, campaign rhetoric is always slightly overheated and then when the administration comes in, they settle in and they confront their realities and they have to make the choices. The so Prime Minister, we, we already know one key act that he has already taken, which is to walk America away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a deal which Singapore was very much a part of, and now the Americans want no part of it. Yes, we were disappointed by that because we all spent a long time negotiating it. It was a hard one deal, carefully balanced, and the Americans bargained hard, and uh, so did the other countries, and we felt that Singapore particularly felt that it was important not just economically, because it's 40% of the world's GDP brought in in the participants, but also strategically, because it and deepened America's engagement in Asia and gave a rationale for America to take a close interest in Asia and try to make things work out well in Asia. So what signal does it send of America's feelings about its engagement with Asia? Well, I think it shows that um, on this issue, Mr. Trump was following through on his campaign rhetoric. But I do not believe that the administration is planning to pull back from Asia or to pull back from the world. Well, I, I mean, on the contrary, they've said he wants a muscular engagement, and uh, we'll have to see what that means. Well, let me quote to you your own words from Time magazine last autumn, actually just before Trump won the election, but it was clear that he stood a chance. You said that if the United States went back on the TPP trade deal, how would anyone believe in the Americans anymore? You said it's not just about trade, it's about strategic issues too. Well, America is a reality, it's still a great power. It's, I think this has done, put a dent in the um, degree to which people can be confident of America's policies. 
but it has happened and we have to live with it. Just last question on TPP. Uh, some other signatories, uh, thinking of Australia, New Zealand, have said that they wouldn't rule out a TPP minus moving ahead without the United States. In Japan, that's seen, I think, to be a non-starter. How is it viewed in Singapore? If there were a consensus and 12 minus 1, 11 countries say, let's go ahead and sign the thing just minus the US, Singapore would sign. Uh, whether that happens, I'm not sure, because the Jap Japanese in particular made very painful concessions in exchange for American concessions. And if you have a deal in which the Japanese have these concessions and the Americans are not party, I think that the political balance and the economic balance has shifted. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I think that it is not so easy to achieve. We talk about uncertainty in Washington. You have to live with that right now. But there's also uncertainty in your relationship with Beijing. Singapore, going back to your father, has always sought strong relationships with both Washington and Beijing. Right now, I look at your relationship with Beijing, and it seems to me you've got some major problems, perhaps symbolized recently when the Chinese impounded for a short time some of your military vehicles because they'd been on exercise in Taiwan. How worried are you about your relationship with the Chinese? I wouldn't say that we have major problems. We've had some I issues and some uh, incidents. I think the military vehicles were an incident which happened to both of us and we had to handle it. Suggested a lack of trust. Well, it's a delicate matter for both sides. And I think both sides handled it carefully and there has been a satisfactory outcome. Uh, to put it bluntly, the Chinese are furious about some policy decisions you've made, not least your decision to support the Court of Arbitration's backing of the Philippines in a dispute in the South China Seas. The, 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 the Chinese feel that you are betraying a friendship. No, I, I think uh, you, you misparaphrase me because I didn't strongly support the court's ruling, what I said was that the court had made a strong statement, and there's a difference. And well, let, let's be clear, the uh, court, you know, this is a respected international no, court, the court, they sided with the Philippines. Statement. The Chinese do not accept it, the Filipinos do, but it was, if you read the ruling, it was a, it was a ruling and which, which side, in very strong in, in terms. In that dispute, which side, Prime Minister, has justice on its side, the I Chinese th or the Philippines? I think we don't judge specific claims. No, but you respect no the court, and the court's made a decision. We respect international courts. Decisions are made. They can be scrutinized. They can be examined. They can be criticized. In Singapore's case, our interest is freedom of navigation, rule of international law, and also the co cohesion of ASEAN and the relevance of ASEAN. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, if I'm looking at this from the Beijing point of view, also your decision during the Obama administration period in 2015 to sign a deeper defense agreement with the Americans and to the Chinese that looks like a, a, a statement a statement of intent which works against their interests. We've had this relationship with the US for a long time. We buy a lot of military equipment from them. We train on a, quite a big scale in the United States. Our Air Force is there and for now more than nearly 30 years we have had we have hosted American aircraft and ships in the region which pass through and stop in Singapore. And we think that it is the right thing for us to do because we believe that American presence in the region is positive for the region and the security presence is positive for the region. It's brought about stability, it's enabled countries to prosper and to compete peacefully. And therefore, we believe it's in our interest to be helpful to the Americans. I guess it just indicates that at a time of, let's be honest, rising tension in the region, and with Donald Trump talking about a, a new America first policy, and we've discussed the protectionism aspect of that, things are getting very difficult for Singapore. If America-China relations become very difficult, our position becomes tougher, because then we will be coerced to choose between being friends with America and friends with China. That's a real worry for you. And that's a real worry. Right now, we are friends with both. It's not that we don't have issues with either, but we are generally friends with both and the relationships are in good working but order. Reading the signs, do you believe that Beijing-Washington relations are in danger of deteriorating? I think the relations always require close and sustained attention on both sides. And I'm sure that the Chinese side do that. On the American side, I hope that they will have that attention because 
on the American side, you've got many other issues to worry about. Europe, the Middle East, Ukraine, Latin America. And unless you focus on this relationship, both the win-win aspects as well as the areas where you're in contention, it can go wrong. You just mentioned Europe. Let me switch attention to Europe for a second, and in particular, the looming prospect of Brexit. When you look at the United Kingdom as a place to do business as a trading and investment partner, from your point of view, has Brexit strengthened or weakened the United Kingdom? Well, from, we have no vote on this. Uh, uh, from our point of view, we think that Brexit weakens the EU. Uh, we are not sure it strengthens the United Kingdom. Uh, you can make a living, you will not starve outside the EU, but it's an enormous market, it's on your doorstep, you can't avoid doing business with it, and if you can't influence it, you may not have strengthened your influence in the world. This, this is what uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson said very recently. He said, you know, uh, let, let's understand what we're dealing with here. He said the world doesn't see Britain through the prism of being a member of the European Union. The, the nations of the world see and respect Britain as a major power in its own right. Do you well, think that, looking from Singapore, do you think that's true? Singapore is a small country. Uh, we also are trying to make our way in the world and we find it useful and in fact essential that we are part of a regional group, ASEAN. It is not as ambitious as the EU. It doesn't aim for political union or total economic integration, but it's a life raft which gives your voice a bit more influence in the world. Britain's international trade minister, Liam Fox, has been in Singapore just yes, over I've the last few days. Yes. Uh, did you meet him? Not this time. I've met him before. But I think he met your trade officials. Yes, he did. Uh, Britain now is very eager to begin work on bio, you know, uh, very far-reaching bilateral trade deals. And obviously, as a, an important trading nation in the world, they're looking at Singapore. Do you think Singapore is ready? Are you already in negotiation? With We're Britain? not in negotiation, but we would be willing and happy to do that. And uh, when Britain is ready, I think you have many countries with which you wish to do deals, starting with the United States. Uh, you have to do that. And, but the fact is, you are doing it on your own. There's an active debate in the UK about how these trade deals, bilateral deals, should be done and what values should be brought to bear. For example, uh, opposition figures uh, have said, look, if we are going out to countries around the world looking for preferential trade deals, we must not and cannot turn a blind eye to human rights issues, to abuses, violations in the pursuit of sweetheart trade deals. Some have even mentioned Singapore. This is what uh, Tim Farron, leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK, said. He, he said, if we're to seek a deal with Singapore, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, must raise issues of freedom of expression and freedom of the press in any trade talks with Singapore. How do you respond to that? I don't see you being restrained in asking me any questions. No, I'm not, but that's, <laughs> not really, that's not really the point, is it? The point is whether you would be prepared to offer guarantees on your treatment of the press at home here in Singapore, no, I, whether you'd be prepared to talk about wider freedoms for the press well, I in this I would not country. presume to tell you how your press council should operate. Why should you presume to tell me how my country should run? We are completely open. You're, we have one of the fastest internet accesses in the world. We have no great wall of the internet. You can get any site in the world you so, wish. So, so, if the government so of where Britain, is the restriction? So if the government of Britain were to make linkages between a trade deal and uh, seeking guarantees about human rights, press freedoms, workers' rights, demonstrators' rights in this country, your reaction would be? <laughs> I, would, I would wait to react until I see it. Uh, you, you look at the Americans, they don't lack fervor and um, moral causes. Uh, they promote democracy, freedom of speech, women's rights, gay rights, at some time even transgender rights. But you don't see them applying that universally across the world with all their allies? Yes, they do it where the cost is low. But you don't and then the you can take a high position. But you look at some of the most important oil producers in the world. Do they conform? Have they been pressured? You have to do business. And you the world is a diverse place. Nobody has a monopoly of virtue or wisdom. 
And unless we can accept that and we prosper together and cooperate together, accepting our differences, differences in values, differences in outlooks, differences even in the, what we see the goals of life to be, uh, I think it becomes difficult. Let's, if we may, just spend a little bit of time thinking about the values that uh, are represented here in Singapore. It, it's a democracy, I think you're proud of your democracy, and yet the reality is that there has been one party in power, the party that your father founded and was the central figure within, one party rule ever since the independence of Singapore. Most people in the West would say that for a, a, a really active, successful democracy, you need a powerful opposition that has the very real prospect of winning power, but you don't have that in this country. I wouldn't say it's one party rule. It's the government has only belonged to one party, but there are many parties in Singapore and the elections but Prime are Minister, you, you know as well as I do. I mean, the, the number of MPs from the opposition in your parliament is just a handful. In fact, you had to pass a law guaranteeing them certain positions, because otherwise there'd be virtually none. Well, there are now six elected, three unelected. Yeah, out nine, of 100 so and we're making, some. Yeah. You know, about 80 plus. And then we're going, to, we're going to increase the number to 12. But really, it's the workings of our democratic system. The population voted. They prefer PAP candidates to become members of parliament. They have confidence in the PAP to form the government and to govern them well. As long as that happens, I can have such an outcome in Parliament. It, once the government stops functioning, or for that matter, if I have a member of Parliament who doesn't perform his duties and loses the confidence of his voters, and I feel him again, the situation will change overnight. Mm. It's open. Well, your, your country uh, is, uh, is so open in terms of its economy, but so not open in, in some other ways. I mean, we, just, we, we... Just because the voters have voted for me and my party doesn't mean we're not open. Yeah, but, but hang on a minute. I mean, just look, look at the realities. You've got an Internal Security Act, which still allows people to be locked up without charge or trial. The, the only people we have locked up in the recent decades have been terrorists and Islamist extremists. Well, you've also actually taken legal action against teenage bloggers for things that they've written online. You've got huge Human Rights Watch saying Prime Minister Lee is imposing a mix of absolute political control and repression of dissenting voices that was the hallmark of his father. If it were such a miserable place, you wouldn't be interviewing me. You would be going down the streets and getting vox pox, vox pop, and all sorts of people would be saying terrible things about the government, and some of them would have emigrated. But the fact is, Singaporeans are happy, they have chosen this government, we are do governing the country and the people to the best of our ability. And millions more would like to come in if we allowed them. Well, let's talk symbols then, uh, about the identity of Singapore today and what you want it to look like in the years to come. There's been a, a lot of uh, discussion, shall I say, inside this city-state about your repressive law on homosexuality. It is still technically illegal thanks to statute I think number 377A for two consenting male adults to have sex. It is a criminal offence. Now I know that the Singapore judicial authorities choose not to prosecute men for doing it but why not as a symbol of change in this country get that off the statute book? It's a matter of society values. We inherited this from British, British Victorian attitudes. And I'm sure you do not want Singapore today to reflect British Victorian attitudes. We are not attitudes. British, we are not Victorian, but this is a society which is not that liberal on these matters. Attitudes have changed, but I believe if you, were, if you had a referendum on the issue today, 377A would stand. You have a majority to leave. of you Singaporeans. Have to You've been in power for what more than twelve years yourself. Is it not your role as a leader to signal to your people that Singapore can and must adapt to changing social mores? On social moral issues, I think the government's role is not to lead. It is people believe this. They believe this. Some of them believe this fervently. It's a vexed issue in every society. Let me ask you personally, I think we Prime just Minister. Let I mean, I, I, I don't wish to, to 
sound rude in any way, but, but if, you, you never are. <laughs> if any of your children or grandchildren were gay, would that change your perspective? Would you then think it were unacceptable for, for consenting adults to be criminalized in this way? I, I think that it's a law which is there. If I remove it, I will not remove the problem. Because if you look at what has happened in the West, I mean, you, in Britain, you decriminalized it in the 1960s. Uh, your attitudes have changed a long way, but even now, gay marriage is contentious. In America, it's very contentious. Even in France, in Paris, they've had demonstrations in the streets against gay marriage. But what's your personal view? Would you like, all things being equal, to get rid of 377A? My personal view is that if I don't have a problem, this is an uneasy compromise. I'm prepared to live with it until social attitudes change. We're, we're almost out of time. Just a couple of quick questions on Singapore's future um, and, and its future leadership. Uh, in 2008, you, you gave an interview where you indicated that you didn't think Singapore was ready for a, a Muslim non-Chinese prime minister. Do you still feel that today? I think that ethnic considerations are never absent when voters vote. It's like that in America, certainly in this last election, and in Singapore it's much better than before, but race and religion count. And I think that makes it difficult, it's not impossible, and I hope one day it will happen. Is it ready but today? I Is Singapore ready today? If you ask whether it will happen tomorrow, I don't think so. I mean, put it this way, one of your deputies, so one can assume a man that you believe to be qualified to be PM, if, if it should arise, uh, is, is Taman Shanmugaratnam. Yes. Now, he and I have discussed this yes. as it happens. Yes. He told me that he didn't believe he would ever be PM of Singapore, and polls suggest that most Singaporeans see him as the man best qualified to be the next PM. Perhaps it's time to reassess. It's, it may be I'm wrong, but my sense is that Singaporean voters will look for a good man, a man who can resonate with them, a man they can identify with. Could it be, Ta it, could it, it be Mr. Taman? I mean, it could be somebody like Taman, but... Well, he's your deputy. I yes, mean, indeed. It could be somebody like him. But these are factors which voters take into consideration when they go into the ballot box and when they identify with you. And I think there are very few countries where you can say the race doesn't count at all. Well, that, that's race. Let's talk about name as well. I mean, the, the truth of, of the matter is that in Singapore, your father led this country for more than 30 years. You've led it yourself for more than 12 years. Do you not think that it is going to be difficult for Singapore to move beyond the Lee family? Nobody is immortal. I will have to hand over as Prime Minister and there will have to be a successor. And Prime Minister, you, you, again, it's a little personal, but you, you, you did have a health scare last year. Uh, uh, two years ago. Yes, and I mean, you recovered and we all understand that you're feeling well. Do you intend to go on and on? No, I don't. I've said that many times. Well, how, the, so tell me about the succession. Your father always said organizing the su succession is crucial. And I think you've said it too. So how is the succession going to work? It's the most difficult job. I've assembled a team of younger ministers. Some are about 50, some are in their 40s. And amongst them, they're able people. They have to work together. They have to build a team. They have to build a trust of Singaporeans and amongst themselves, they must throw up and acknowledge and support a leader. Will you pick that leader? I cannot pick that leader. They have to decide whom they are going to work for. And if I pick the leader and they don't support him when they decide that they are off to become uh, the curator of the Victorian Albert Museum or something like that, well, that's the end of Singapore. Prime Minister Lee Xianlong. Thank you so much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.